Good morning. It's great to see so many of you here. Um, um, I would want to tell you a little bit about my personal journey. Uh, I've been an academic for over 20 years, and in particular, my journey started in uh, 1999 when I finished my PhD at the London School of Economics, and a book was published. That book is called Information Rules, and the authors are Alvarian and Carl Shapiro. Alvarian then went on to become a, the chief economist of Google, and is still the chief economist of Google there. And this wonderful book, which has a lot of stories, these two professors were at Berkeley, at the, at the time, so in the heart of Silicon Valley, they told us that digital platforms were basically promising a nirvana for economists. These digital platforms would have you know, seamless hopping from one uh, uh, platform to the next. They would be multi-homing. You can choose what you want. There would be rational search, very low transaction costs. You really get all the information you need. And once you obtain all the information you need, you can make your informed choice. Okay? That's a model of a rational agent. Information would spread all over. The, the economy would be so dynamic, and in a sense, there was a promise of democracy, because that sounds like a good proposition, all what I just said. That was wonderful, and, and that informed the first few years of my personal academic research. And I started with theory models first, and then I said, well, I want to see how it works in practice. So I knocked at, at, the, at the door of these digital giants that were actually becoming the big common companies we, we know, and I asked them, well, can I have access to some data for academic re research? I'm not interested. I mean, I'm an academic. I'm a, I'm a geek, okay? Can I, but I'm really interested to see what's going on. I want to see behavior in practice. And the doors uh, never opened, never opened. So since you, de you do want to see what's happening, you have to act by proxy. Since I couldn't get access directly from the Facebook, from the, from, from the Google, from the Amazon, I did something different. So I teamed up with Ofcom, which because it's a simple idea. I said, okay, ultimately, especially in the early days, if you are on the internet, you need an infrastructure. You need broadband, okay? Without any uh, connection, <laughs> it's not gonna work. Mobile phones at the time were not what we know now. So I teamed up with the telecoms regulator, the communication regulator of COM, and they gave me access to all the uh, location of the so-called local exchanges. So that's where, basically wherever BT and the, and the entrance via local loop and un bundling would bring technology. And I could follow uh, quarter after quarter for 10 years how broadband actually developed in the UK. The England and, and the Wales, Scotland is cut off. And then I, I, I went a little bit further. This is, uh, uh, so I was anticipating what's going to happen in a few years. So the, 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 I did something further. I asked uh, some other data provider, so a major mortgage provider, to give me data about the transaction prices of homes which were sold and, and purchased. So these little dots you see, you see the catchment area. The black dot is a local exchange, and you see the properties which are connected, the catchment area of the local exchange, and the dots with colors would be properties of which I knew everything from the mortgage provider, the number of rooms, the balcony, and et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. For a uh, interesting, for a researcher is what happens, now I know there is a trick, huh? <laughs> is what happens at the boundary, okay? At the boundary, you literally would have homes on the same street. But on the left-hand side of the street, you would have a house which is connected to a very close local exchange. We'd have the, the top technology available at the time. And on the right-hand side of the street, instead by accident, by historical accident, you would have a house which instead is connected to the local exchange, which was far away, three miles away, which means your connection is crap, and the, 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 there was not the latest technology. So this discontinuity, but the rest would be identical, right? Because the same schools, the same local transport, the same amenities, so you can really control for a lot of things. And this is something that, in research, really helps you identify the chain of causation. You want to see, when broadband arrived, did it have an impact on something? Because academics are a strange breed, and they're not convinced that this is enough for identification, we did something even further. So we said, OK, you're not convinced. We collected information about 
unexpected rain in every area in the UK for 15 years. And basically, we said local exchanges were subject to unexpe unexpected floodings, okay? And as you might imagine, water and software don't go well together. So unexpected floodings really impaired the performance of a, long, of, of a local exchange for a while, as opposed to local exchanges instead that were in dry areas or on top of the hill. Those work much better, Shatter is paribus, other things equal. So this kind of uh, exogenous events allow you to identify causation. And what were the outcomes of interest for us? The first one was the impact on politics. So I basically saw when I go to identical areas with identically, uh, with equivalent people, but these guys got access to the internet much earlier or a better internet, and these guys didn't. Ultimately, did they get more or less engaged with politics? Okay? Did they turn out to vote more or less? Because you, know, you have two stories there. Internet is a great source of information. You get to know more, and that uh, improves par political participation. But internet is also a source of labor. Okay, you may just say, okay, I don't care. I'm gonna spend my time of you on YouTube or on Facebook and my friends and I disengage completely with my local politics. What turns out, this is one paper which I which I publish, what turns out is that in the UK at least, and at least when it comes to uh, 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 local uh, elections, the more the internet diffuses, the less people turn out to vote. And this is totally driven by demographics. It's not true if you're old, if you're not true if you're rich, if you're not tr it's not true if you're educated. But it is actually true if you are poor, uneducated, and young. Okay? So these are the three categories that disengage once they, they have the, the internet. And why? We, we, we made services, we went to interview, precisely what, what I said. The poor people, once they spend money on some subscription to the broadband, it may be a package which has football, they don't spend money on anything else. Okay? They don't subscribe to newspapers any longer, they cancel their, their subscription, and they spend time watching stuff. Okay? And they don't know, they're not informed on the, on the, on the side of politics. So that was when I started having doubts. I had, a, and this is just a, a, a graph, a big impact on media. As you know, the internet has been fantastic for hyper-targeted advertising. You can have really an efficient way of, con of contacting individuals, but that meant a drain of resources away from traditional media. Because if you are an advertiser, you won't be interested in putting your money any longer on the Financial Times on a TV channel, but because you would find it much more efficient to target people on Facebook, on Google, and the like. But this meant that newspapers are disappearing. Okay? That, this means that newspapers are, are disappearing. What about choice? What about choice? Are we more or less informed? This is some research I did with a Dutch colleague. This is why. Uh, this is just snapshots, why you see some funny words because this is Dutch, the funny language. So this is over 10 years, and it's basically this idea of the internet supplying us a source of information, okay? But is it true? Okay, we are probably in this room, we are not representative of the market, okay? The 99 of, of, of the percent of the market does not behave like us. They don't go on DuckDuckGo, they don't get all the information. They, start, they stay on the first result, on the first few results they, they see, especially if they see things through the mobile devices. The mobile devices, it's a small screen, you never scroll down. So this is simple search car insurance in Holland. And this is what you would see from the early days, 10 years ago, you would see the top. I've put the red box because it wouldn't be red. Eh? You would simply see, uh -huh. you would simply see something like there is a symbol that tells you there may be some advertising, but you wouldn't see it. It's a different color. Uh, but the top results would be paid ads. Okay? And the others are the so-called organic results, which, which should be the better fit. So in the early days, you had the screen, not too large, but you had quite a few organic research and a few paid ads. Over time, basically, access to our attention, the screen, because these platforms, that's what they do. They grab our, our attention, and they want us to stay online on their properties as long as, property, as, long as possible. And then uh, in, in last year, basically, all the screen space is taken by ads. So you don't see what is necessarily the best thing, the best result for you. It is the result for whom somebody pays the most. 
okay? Which is a different proposition I want to return on. So since I had many doubts, I decided to do another part of my journey, and I went to Brussels. I went to Brussels uh, three years ago, and for three years, I was the chief economist of the European Commission for competition. This is a commissioner, Margarete Vestager. She's a great, great woman, and now she's vice president of the European Commission. It's been a, a fantastic experience, but I'm also very happy to be back in academia, and I, I wanted to see how things were going on with, with the digital platform. So, uh, we ran several cases against the digital giants. This slide there is just to say something that for an ordinary person is unthinkable. The market capitalization of the GAFAM, the Google, the Amazon, the Facebook, the Apple, and the Microsoft, they are in the range of $1 trillion each, okay? If you update it with the first quarter of 2020, more will, will be there. So one trillion, it's, it's, an, it's 12 zeros. These are things which are not, you know, normal human beings are not used to, okay? 12 zeros, it's a lot. And so these are the cases which I run in the digital space. The first one, Apple tax. So Apple who didn't pay taxes in, in Ireland for 13 billion euros, and Google Shopping, Google Android, and Google AdSense. These are the behavioral cases against Google. I will give you one example, and Amazon Marketplace, which is a case I started last summer before coming back to Imperial. So um, what's happening there? These companies are very different. The business models they rely on are totally different. Google and Facebook, they rely on ads. Again, it's important to have a feeling for what's going on. Google and Facebook in 2020 will make the two of them have more than $300 billion in ad revenues. 300 billion revenues in a single year. Two thirds go to Google, one third goes to Facebook, roughly. To give, it gives you an idea. Uh, this is advertising fund, and they make 95% of the money from ads, from selling ads, okay? Still now, still in 2020. Amazon is a, is a marketplace, okay? So, and what's the problem? It's a completely different market, uh, business model. The problem of Amazon might be what some people term, can you be a referee and a player at the same time? They are a referee because they're a, a matchmaker, but they're also a player because they supply their own goods as well. And uh, selling stuff, Apple and uh, Microsoft are more ordinary people in a sense because they sell software, they sell devices. Interestingly, Microsoft has been the last case in the US in the past 20 years where some antitrust intervention has happened. And uh, it's the only company which is not actually under the radar of any competition authority, which is interesting. So perhaps if you slap one of the companies, then at some stage they'll learn how to behave. And it's still a very profitable and, uh, and very well-run company, actually. It is worth $1 trillion. So what happened? As Mark Zuckerberg said, these companies move very fast and break things, and they've broken lots of things in the process. They've broken competition laws, privacy laws, the taxation laws, and all that stuff. This is the example I want just one I want to give you. This is a comparison shopping services. So when you look for a pair of shoes, if you put Nike shoes, you will see a box where you can buy the shoes. Okay? Google, so, and, there, and there are comparison shopping services that were thriving in the early days. You may or may not know them. They were called Kelku, they were called Trova Pretz in Italy. There were some of these CSS, comparison shopping services. And Google started with something called Frugal. They were crap. They were really bad. And they knew they were bad. There is lots of internal documents. They tried to change. They were called product universals. They were still bad. Then they launched Google Shopping with a nice innovative feature, which was the box. The box with nice, they would show you the Nike shoes, OK? That was great. But they did two things at the same time. The box was accessible only to their products. And they also applied a filter called the Panda filter that was, would automatically demote all the rivals' comparison shopping services from the organic search. So what happened is this. This is, this is what you would see Nike shoes before Google introduced the box. Then they introduced the box, pulling down everyone else. So the rivals go down. And I saw 99% of the clicks are on the first result. OK, 99% of the clicks in practice. So, and the money goes up. And the money goes up because if you, make a, if, if you click on, uh, on a link, uh, that's when Google is making money. And this is the filter. You see, uh, from organic search, there would be lots of traffic to CSS until the Panda filter was, was int introduced in a matter of months then the, the traffic to the rivals died out. So these platforms are very powerful, but they can use in all, in all sorts of ways. So 
The theory, remember, Halvarian, still chief economist of Google, who told us this nirvana would, would, would come along. But in practice, I see that 99% of searches in Europe start from Google. 99%, 90% of social networks in Europe is actually on, on uh, Facebook. It's very difficult to port your data. You cannot port your friends from Facebook to another so social network. And uh, people don't inform themselves. They don't go down. They don't go down the page. So I'm going to skip this. And I'm going to instead, I'm going to, uh, do we have three more minutes? OK, three more minutes is a quote also from 1999. I'm, I'm going to quote, I'm going to read it, the quote from two academics 20 years ago. We expect that advertising funded search engines will be biased against consumers and in favor of advertisers. So a competitive search engine has to be transparent and in the academic realm. Okay? This is academics, computer scientists, who published it in a journal. The authors were called Sergey Brin and Larry Page. Okay? So they knew it. They knew it. And then they did something different in practice. They knew that the business model was, was, was going to create problems. This is uh, from the New York Times last summer. And the New York Times discovered that YouTube, YouTube, you know, it's owned by Google, by the way. We learned the other day that they made $15 billion uh, last year, which is a lot from ads again. So YouTube recommends your videos. And it, the scandal was that YouTube was recommending videos to convicted pedophiles, videos of children, OK? That's horrible. Everybody agrees that's horrible. That shouldn't happen. Google agreed that that was horrible. But there are two lessons there. It took a long time to realize it. And why did it take a, a long time? Because in order to see what the algorithm recommends a pedophile, you need to think as a pedophile. You need to have a history of, of, a, of a pedophile. You and I wouldn't see that, that recommendation. Nobody really knew. Okay? So it's not true, as Zuckerberg said, that you know, this is uh, exposes to the sun. The internet has gone away from this idea of having the ability to show everything to everybody. It has become so hyper-targeted. And the second uh, lesson to be learned is that the algorithm wants to maximize engagement. It's not about ethics here. It's about the, 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 they want to make money. And if the making money means keeping you online as long as possible, the algorithm, because at some stage you will click on some bloody advertising, then the idea is to give you what makes you stay online, which is a model of Facebook at times. So, the politics, uh, violence, this is exactly what keeps people online as long as possible until after a few hours they know exactly who you are and you're, you're going to be selling things. So uh, the question for you, where do you stand? Where do you stand? So you are representing companies and startups. When you innovate, why do you do that? Do you do that? I've spoken to guys in Silicon Valley. Do you do, you do that because your dream is to be bought by Facebook and Google? Or do you dream to become a disruptor? Okay. In the current situation, most people dream of being bought by Facebook and Google because they make money individually. But is that the right model of innovation for society? It's not, because it's just, it's just a transfer of rents. You just want to get, a, you become individually very rich, okay? but you're not contributing to society. And why? And why you do that? Would your answer change if you were in a world with more open interfaces, with APIs that would allow, for instance, the transfer of the social network of Facebook? You can, like we did in mobile phones, right? We, 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 we impose number portability. If you change operator, you don't have to start from scratch, understanding who your friends and contacts are. If we have that system in the, in, for social platforms, would you, the answer to how would you innovate? Would you more likely to become a, a disruptor? change. So I know you're very busy. Okay? I know you're very busy. You have lots of things to do. You're not, you're not thinking along these lines, but you should. And you must be heard. There is an opportunity in this crazy country. And there's an opportunity now which is called the Digital Market Unit, which this government has decided, actually Theresa May and Boris Johnson confirmed, which is starting now. And it is the Digital Market Unit which is discussing exactly what kind of interfaces. How do we find the right you know, balance between privacy and competition? What will be the impact on firms in Cambridge? not in Silicon Valley, because these are companies that are based in the, in the UK. 
In this process, which is happening as we speak, it's already started a few months ago, the incumbents, they know how to be heard. The Google, the Facebook are always there. They are constantly talking to the, to the policymakers because they know them, they know the game. You don't, okay? You don't and you should. And you should, you should present your views before actually actions are taken and then you will be just responding passively to whatever government decides. So I really hope you will engage with these important questions because they affect the core of your business models. So thank you very much and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks a lot. So we have some questions for you as well oh, yes. that have come in from, from, the, from the app. So, from the app? Yes. Okay. So as you can see here. Yeah. Well, at least it's the, the kind of the network here. So hopefully these are good questions. So the first one, is the internet as good a source of information as promised? So let's, let's look at all of them. Okay. I'll start with the number two. Do governments need to take a bigger role in government the internet? Yes, yes. So for 20 years, we haven't done anything, basically, okay? The GAFAM bought 850 companies. They grow by organic growth, which is great, and by acquisition. 850 companies, we blocked zero. 99% of those acquisitions were not even vetted by any antitrust authority, okay? This cannot go on like this. I'm not saying they should be blocked necessarily, but at least the, the government should do its own job. Of course, government means also red tape, and so it's, but we have experience in industries with network effects, infrastructure. I mentioned telecoms because I know it well. That's fine, we had an incumbent British Telecom, we tried to elicit competition, in the end the market grew. Investments happen and consumers are better off, but there was also ex ante regulatory intervention, access to the local loop, access to the infrastructure that BT had, and mobile number portability. This kind of, of analogy we can make with the internet. Advertising, we have regulated advertising on television. We don't allow billboards to be put anywhere on the, on the public spaces. And the internet is a public space in a sense, okay? So such a sort of regulation is unavoidable. It's, it's unavoidable. So it's almost like a reframe of what the internet the internet, a good source of it, it can be. These are amazing technologies. It can be. I am becoming skeptical when it comes to these you know, bubbles created by hyper-targeted stuff. I'm really worried about political campaigning. I'm really worried. So on Twitter, for instance, Jack, Dor Jack Dorsey said, I will not allow political ads, paid political ads on the Twitter platform. Zuckerberg in Georgetown said, well, uh, we make so little money and so it's better to, to have political ads so people can discuss about it. And Zuckerberg is wrong. It's wrong because A, Facebook never released the real figures about political money they make. He said one to 2%, which would still be a billion if not $2 billion, that to me is a lot of money. The, the second point is that, uh, as I told you earlier, it's not directly the effect of political ads, okay? But political discussion creates the engagement that keeps people on the platform. So the indirect effect is really what is driving people spending as much time as possible. But obviously, in order to be well informed, we need also to change our attitude. We need to ask questions, we need to realize, and that was the Cambridge Analytica case. Just one word on Cambridge Analytica. I'm not going to talk about uh, the Trump campaign or the Brexit referendum, but this is what happened. 200,000 people decided to give their own information, their own uh, Facebook in information, and let's assume they knew what they were doing, because that's a typical answer. I get Facebook for free, I'm happy for people to access because I've got nothing to hide, okay? Let's assume that people really understand through the process what that means, okay? But then by, by releasing uh, data about 200,000 people, they also gave access, statistically relevant information about their own friends, their own contacts. At the end, Cambridge Analytica created a data set about 80 million voters, okay? From that original 200,000, that's an externality. The analogy for you to think, to simplify things, is that when you smoke a cigarette, okay? This has become very rare, but people still smoke. There's one level, which is the information. Do you know about the health consequences? Do we know how our information is used? I think the answer is no, but let's inform people. Let's make sure people are well informed, like I put on the pack of cigarettes, the consequences of smoking. But that's a private decision, okay? You want to live fast and die young, it's your business, okay? 
But then there is the other aspect. People can smoke in a public space. There would be externalities. Okay? So it's not enough to give enough information. We need to tax cigarettes because there is an externality effect. And that's the same with information. One thing is knowing about the consequences. We are not yet there. The second thing is that because of this st statistical collection of information, there are external effects that need to be regulated. We go back to the original point. Some intervention is absolutely Need, need. Okay. What is the measure of truth? This is really. And this will be the last question. <laughs> the measure, no. And I'm, I'm saying this is early in the, in, the, in the day. Maybe tonight after a beer, we can talk about the truth, but not now. <laughs> and take the chance to talk to all the fantastic speakers in the break. That's what they're here for as well. Thanks again.